NSC is back, but this time it's known as the National STEM Championship. S-T-E-M, what? Well, S-T-E-M stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics. Easy peasy, not. As students from 40 schools found out in the first round of the qualifiers, where they had to complete 60 multiple choice questions in those four subjects. Oh, I could faint. And after that tough hurdle, all 40 schools were sent off to the Science Centre. Welcome to the National STEM Championship 2022 qualifying round 2. The second part of the qualifying round, the Mystery Box Challenge. This challenge is called the Mystery Box Challenge. Uh, the materials are provided in the box, so uh, they are only allowed to use the materials that are provided for them to make the rocket. The judging criteria are broken down into three different sections. We will measure the greatest distance that the rocket travel, and then teamwork, and last but not least will be the load that the rocket can carry. When you're thinking of something that could just fly very far, and what we thought was an arrow, we were supposed to make something that flies, but thinking outside the box, we make the rocket roll across the floor. Oh, we got a roller, you know? 470. We went with a design that is light and miniature. This is the smallest rocket we have ever seen. Because the point benefit that we get from carrying a load of marbles is far less than the point benefit we can get out of a farther distance. That's why we chose a rocket that could really fly far. I would say all the teams show very creative work. We've seen very creative ones like they have built a parachute on the rocket. We also have uh, rockets that look like gliders. Uh, the most exciting part was most probably building the rocket and like the bonding time and we're now all best friends. Go, Go Rocket! I think as a team, we were quite relieved and we enjoyed the experience of being here. It's actually very nice to see the students back here at the Science Centre and they really put in effort. So uh, I want to wish all the students all the best in the following uh, competition. I hope to see us in the quarterfinals as well. Well, I think our chances are pretty good. Watch out! <laughs> Seven hundred and eleven. Yes! Ideas bloomed and some egos were bruised, but here are the top 26 schools that made it to the quarterfinals. Well done to the future Elon Musk and NASA space explorers. Now that the qualifiers are done and dusted, it's time to move on to the quarterfinals. Our teams will face off in a nail-biting, brain-melting series of six challenges and we'll find out who is going to move on to the semi-finals. Find out all this and more in this year's National STEM Championship 2022. Chu and welcome to the National STEM Championship. This year, we aim to continue inspiring the wonders of science in youth and future scientists and engineers. This year's focus is also aligned with research and innovation, and that's why we've combined the elements of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. In the quarterfinals, 26 schools will face a total of six brain-twisting challenges held here at the Science Centre, Singapore, and tonight, the spotlight is on these eight schools. Anderson Secondary School, Commonwealth Secondary School, Anglo-Chinese School International, Bedok Green Secondary School, St. Joseph's Institution, St. Patrick's School, Bukit Batok Secondary School, and Hua Chong Institution. With just 15 minutes to complete the challenge, schools had to bring their A-game. The teams were each given two chemistry equations to solve. After finishing each equation, they had to send two team members into the mirror maze to find balls labelled with the right elements to form the answer of the equation they solved earlier. The equations were tough, so we had to work together as a group to figure out all the chemical formula of the different substances.
But here's where the tricky part comes in. Points were deducted for every additional element picked up but not used. Plus, it goes without saying, it's pretty tough to find your way in a maze full of mirrors. It was definitely a new experience because as soon as we went there, we saw a lot of balls, but they weren't labeled. So obviously, they were there to confuse us. Each school was judged by every correct equation solved. The number of correctly labeled balls they picked, teamwork, plus the shortest time taken to complete the challenge. So you face your balls or to the board? We find this challenge extremely difficult considering we don't have the usual resources that we have. Most of the stuff in there was out of the syllabus, so I find it was quite hard. The most difficult part was to come up with the equation because for some of the compounds, we weren't exactly sure what was its uh, chemical composition. I think our chemistry is more or less correct. I think what we can prove is like, we will probably clarify at first that there are some decoys inside. We split ourselves into two people outside uh, doing the equations and two of us will run inside the maze to get um, the atoms, basically. A lot of atoms here on both answers. Actually, maybe tell us a bit about your approach to this challenge. The first reaction, the product was directly given to us, vinegar. So the chemical formula would be just be CH3COOH. Excellent. For the second group, propylene, the double bond is performed the addition reaction with the water molecule as with sulfuric acid as a catalyst. Overall, it was quite a fun experience. And I personally found the maze challenge quite fun because it's a bit more active. Uh, it was very fun. It's very fun. It's really inclusive. I like um, the mirror maze a lot. Wow, I am not amazed by my navigational skills. Now, mirrors, mazes, and lack of spatial awareness, that is enough to give me anxiety. But thankfully, we did not leave anyone behind in the maze because that was the very first station. Coming up next, watch as the students attempt to build a bridge, answer questions posed by kids, and stop some wax from melting. All that and more after the break. Welcome back to the National STEM Championship. Now, did you know that most bridges here in Singapore have a weight limit of up to 42,000 kilograms? I did not know that bridges are so strong. I literally cannot get over it. See what I did there? Now, weights on bridges are exactly what the students have to worry about in their next challenge that's called Build a Bridge. Welcome to the Build a Bridge station. So as the name suggests, in this station, you are going to build a bridge using the materials given to you on the table. The first five minutes right, are for you to read your challenge booklet as well as inspect the materials. So after the five minutes is up, you guys will be rolling these dice and that will determine an additional material that you have to use in your bridge. So you will then have 10 minutes to build your bridge. Following that, you will have six minutes to test out as many balls as you need. The ball has to balance on your bridge for at least one minute before it will be counted as a pass. For SJI, your bridge was measured at 26 centimeters, which is really quite tall. Two of the main factors were the balls that could be supported on the bridge and also the height. So we focused more on the height. So we decided to focus on the type of balls that we could hold. That's why our bridge is slightly lower, but I believe it's more stable. I think we thought out the box and in the end, I think we secured the points well. We built it well, even though in the 10 minutes there were many different design ideas. So we ultimately settled on this, which I think worked out. For our design, we tried to go for stability over height, basically to balance the weight of the balls on both ends of the so-called bridge. And of course, the best bridge would be the highest, but also one that would take the weight of the heaviest ball. Plus the one involving the most creativity and teamwork. With some clever strategies in play, all our eight schools crossed that bridge. Now here's a fun fact. Did you know that it takes eight hours for one of your cells to copy its DNA? I'm not talking about biology for nothing because coming up next, our students' knowledge of genetic dysfunctions will be put to the test in the Mutation Challenge. This session is to give the group some knowledge on 
how the mutations that you're born with actually puts you at risk for different diseases. So what we are looking at is actually coronary artery disease and we're looking at a familial form. So if you're born with some specific mutation in a specific gene, how is that going to put you at a higher risk of raising your, your lipid levels in the blood and then subsequently getting an earlier onset of the coronary artery disease. Good morning everyone. I'm going to be today's doctor. So over here, I have a little patient of mine. He is a 38-year-old man. He smokes a bit and he has a familial history of CAD. We had a bit of previous knowledge that we had from studying beforehand and we were able to understand and get a grasp of what solutions we would have for the problems there. I personally speculate he might have something called familial hypocholesterolemia. And he also has several family members with coronary artery disease before the age of 60. And FH would lead to an increase and elevated amount of LDLC cholesterol. And it's said that the main characteristic... So the mutation the gene challenge was really difficult, LDLC mainly because we had to do it under a time constraint. Also, it was like questions requ that required us to think out of the box. So this caused a buildup of cholesterol deposits within, uh, within the blood vessels, you can see here. All of it points towards that he could have inherited it from his parents. Hmm, Gareth, how do you think we can solve this? Oh, well, first we have If to find only the my science presentations were this fun. With only 15 minutes to plan, students had to determine why the patient had familial hypercholesterolemia, which means elevated bad cholesterol and an increased risk of coronary artery disease. Firstly, I think all the groups did really well. Uh, all the schools, the presenters were, were very, very good. One thing that caught our eye was Hua Chong. For them to actually know uh, about the CRISPR technology, gene editing technology, and I think that's quite uh, commendable. So uh, we believe that the best technique to have is CRISPR, which is a type of bacterial technique. Do you know what else requires presentation skills but on a whole other level? Explaining things to kids. And that's exactly what our students will have to face in their fourth station, the Kids Ask Challenge. Welcome to this station called Kids Ask. Here, your challenge is to answer a question asked by a primary school student. Those were some super fun questions from some really bright kids. Think that this station is going to be a breeze? Think again. After each school selected their question from a box, they only had 10 minutes to discuss, then 5 minutes to present. Simple questions don't always mean simple answers. The questions ranged from engineering and physics to biology. In fact, some questions combined these subjects. How does a car move? Some kids might be wondering, how do cars move? Here we will provide a simple explanation for you. Firstly, cars need an energy source. In this case, the energy source is fuel. Fuel helps drive cars. In this example, both wheels are controlled by the engine. However, in this, only the front wheel is controlled by the engine. And the car moves through the use of a force called friction to move the back wheel. The first uh, version of an engine was a steam engine. We related it back to a steam engine, which was the first type of engine uh, humans created. Because uh, to start off, the steam engine's design was way simpler compared to a modern engine. Their presentation, I think it was nice because, you know, remember the theme here was kids ask a question and they really tried to keep the explanation so that it's accessible to primary school students kind of not really moving too far into the technical jargon. So that was good. Why does rainbow have seven colors? Welcome back to another episode of St. Patrick's Kids Show. Do you guys know the seven colors of rainbow? No. no. Oh my goodness. Well, you can remember this with this song. Roy give birth in Vietnam. R for red, O for orange, Y for yellow, G for green, B for blue, I for indigo, and V for... All right, so a rainbow has seven colors due to a phenomena called refraction. I was quite impressed by their presentation because they had actually a small skit and they actually had a mnemonic device like the song to remember the spitting of the light and I was impressed by the way they handled their questions. You might be asking why when you see something you don't see a full spectrum of colours. That's because a colour uh, on an object actually contains a pigment. Bordeaux Green actually pro provide a broader sense by providing other kinds of information like the absorption uh, spectrum, 
like how you see pigments and stuff like that so that they can uh, help to explain the concept better. Do you know when you usually see rainbows? Well, after it rains. That's right, because after it rains, there are, there's more moisture in the sky and more water droplets. And the, the light rays from the sun, which come in the form of white light, Kwa Chong remind the, the students that when you can look for rainbows, I think that's also important to try to connect that to daily lives and daily experiences. How does a bee collect pollen? As the bee collects the nectar. Thankfully, the schools were well prepared. They use ingenious ways to capture attention, like funny skits and different colors and designs. Yellow color uh, powder like thing that sticks to the bee's body. We did a small skit, which I think like if a primary school student were there, I think he or she would really understand it really well. And the judges were laughing as we were presenting it, so I think they found it really funny, which is a good sign. Is there a way to drop an egg from a building without breaking it? So the way that we can do this is by building a parachute. There is a force acting against it. There's something that fights back the Earth's gravity, and that is called air resistance. To add on to that, we can add a cushion at the bottom so that it doesn't break. SGI, um, they got a more open-ended question, and I think they conducted themselves well, and they had a skit as well, so which wraps it up quite nicely. Well done, students. Their simple explanations have helped me understand things a whole lot better and now see the world in a new way. Coming up next, though, they're not through the ringer just yet. They've got two more stations left to go, and the first one includes figuring out a series of codes to program a robotic car and also a challenge that involves beeswax. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the National STEM Championship quarterfinals. Now the question is, have you ever built your own remote controlled car? I couldn't even if I tried. Now if you can relate to that as well, you're about to be really impressed because the next challenge is all about robotic cars. In today's challenge, the uh, students have to reverse engineer a program that has been previously uh, inputted into the, uh, the robot. So uh, in order to do this, they have to uh, probe the, the robot, pressing all the buttons, seeing how it responds, and from there infer uh, what uh, has been previously programmed. So what the, how the car behaves is that when it's not doing anything, it shows an X sign on its screen. When button A is pressed, the car turns left by 90 degrees and when button B is pressed, the car... This challenge put their coding knowledge to the test. They were given codes from the transmitter, the remote, and had to write codes for the receiver, the car. Here's the trick. Besides just moving right, left and forward, there was an element that most missed out. Okay, and if you double tap A, it will continue to rotate. And if you click A, you'll stop that rotation. Uh, of all the teams today, uh, Commonwealth is the first team that mentioned anything about the looping, which is uh, uh, important because, as you know, you know you're, you're building a robot, you cannot just send a single command. Even so, some schools might have surprised the judges, and not in a good way. Can you try pushing both? These buttons control the motor independently, and when we press both together, it's just that both motors are being triggered. Um, the school that actually shocked us the most was Hua Chong. <laughs> Do you, do you realise you can do that? So I think they also misunderstood the challenge and they didn't manage to clarify that in time. We thought that the focus of the question was only on the movement of the car. And in our code, uh, we only focus on the speed of the wheel when the buttons are pressed. Now things are literally heating up in the last challenge and I use the term literally because it has got to do with heat. Our students were given a piece of beeswax and they had to do whatever they could to stop it from melting. Let's find out how they did in the insulation challenge. The station is called Insulation Challenge. So five minutes for you to read the challenge guideline. What makes a boat float on water? It's low centre of gravity and lighter density. To create such a vessel, the students used staples, masking tape, felt cloth, paper, foam sheets, aluminium foil and plastic sheets. And that wasn't the only fun part. Each school was given four coins and they had to buy these materials which were valued differently at one or two coins. At the end of it, the beeswax was placed in each boat and set sail on the hot water. The goal was to keep the piece of wax from melting and the final weight of unmelted wax was measured. Thank you so much. Wait, 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 wait. It's two coins. Huh? Guys, stay with two coins. Oh, 
uh, the whole thing with the beeswax have to be placed inside the water bath. So whether you want it to float or sink is up to you. Our idea was to have a paper boat that would float on the surface of the water with a bit of aluminium foil inside it. Now, some teams thought out of the box, or rather boat, because the beeswax came with a toothpick skewered through it. Some schools placed their beeswax upside down in their vessels, supported solely by the toothpick. Uh, we can just do this. If it's like this, it will definitely float. Because there's a wider other teams tried to conserve their coins and didn't purchase the best insulating materials. On the count of three, you will dip your boat tight into the water, OK? The moment of truth came when some boats sank like the Titanic, while some kept afloat like life rafts. We only used two pieces of paper because we wanted to save money and we thought we could build a boat for it to float. But in the end, it sank and our beeswax totally melted, so it was quite sad. 2.53 for Anderson. Commonwealth all melted. ACS International 1.42. Verdot Green 1.97. Oh, still alive. Still alive. Still alive. Oh. Okay. 2.2. I'll be nice to have IC if you survive. No more ID. We should have used okay, the thank you very much. Wow, that was the challenge that put the students in hot water. Who's writing these scripts? Joaquin Gomez, are you watching me? <laughs> anyway, well done to the eight schools. You guys are finally done and dusted with the National STEM Championship quarterfinals. Give yourselves a pat on the back. And now we've come to the most intense part of the show. Our judges have tabulated all the scores for each school. Now, out of 26 schools, only 12 will move on to the semi-finals. And who will they be? We just gotta stick around to find out. As for tonight's eight schools, here are their rankings. Well done, but will their performance be enough to put them in the top 12 that will progress to the semi-finals? We'll have to find out in the next episode of the National STEM Championship. Now look forward to more running into mirror mazes, building bridges that don't collapse, boats that don't sink, and coding robotic cars. Meantime, I'm Sonia Chu, and I'll see you next time.